Today's discussion is going to be a little bit unique. I'm really giving two different messages to two different groups of people all at the same time. One group <clears throat> and one message is for all of those up through the age of 25 or 30, young people, teenagers. And I know that, don't tell Adam, but he was supposed to be here with half of the young people in the church this morning, but he's not. I'm sure for good reason. But anyway, I realize there's not a whole lot of young folks in our congregation, but it's still it's important information. And I don't know who's out there in TV land who will see this later on YouTube or wherever, so hopefully it'll be of value. But the other message is for those in the room who are older than that, but, ne but may know someone who is a teenager or a young person. And as we go through this, you'll have to listen to know when I'm talking to whom. Because a lot of things will apply to everybody, and some will apply to you, and others will apply to the other group. And with those thoughts in mind, I want to ask a question. And like Mr. Casperson, don't raise your hand. Don't shout out loud. Just think to yourself. Do you believe that we are living in the last days and that the world is about to implode on itself? And however you answer that question in your mind, I want you to think about the impact that the answer to that question has on each of the two aforementioned groups, whether you're younger or whether you're older. I recently, last few months, had a conversation with a pastor who is one who works a lot with the young people in the church. He's in high demand to speak where there are young, gatherings of young people, very highly respected among the 13 to 20 age crowd. And he shared with me something that these young folks had said to him over a period of time. And it's something that's been on my mind ever since he told me. Something that I've been guilty of and have had to repent of. He told me this conversation about talking to young people and what they've said to him. I'm paraphrasing, but it goes like this. <clears throat> I really like the olders in our congregation, but whenever I try to have a conversation with them, all they want to talk about is how bad the world is and it's all going to end tomorrow. And I'm young. I'm going to grow up and go to college and get married and have a family and do all these things. It is so depressing talking to them, even though I really like them. And when, he, when this pastor told me this, I immediately thought, guilty as charged. Because since the last election, <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time in sermons talking about the times in which we live the signs of the times, trying to encourage people, point out these things. And I was totally unaware that I was killing the joy of a lot of the people that I was speaking to. It occurred to me that I was doing to them what had been done to me years and years ago. And it had a very negative impact on my life. <clears throat> Today I'm speaking to all of those who still have unfulfilled dreams, who still want to achieve goals in this life, things that they will have things that they want to accomplish, things they still want to do. And it's especially that younger group. And at 72 years of age, it would not offend me. If you listen and you say, what can that old guy know about what I'm thinking, about what's going on in my mind, on my dreams and my aspirations? Well, it's true that we all do experience life a little bit differently and not quite the same experiences. But I think I can 
relate. I hope you'll give me a chance to listen to some of the things that I want to say. If you're in that group that can only barely remember what it was like to be young and full of dreams and full of ambition and full of ideals, this sermon is for you as well. Because many of us, I think, based upon the conversation with that pastor, need to adjust our attitudes, our thinking. If we are going to fulfill our God-given roles as elders, as we relate to the youngers. I was six years old in 1958 when my family first attended their first church, well, it was a radio Church of God church service. I can't recall for certain whether it was trumpets or atonement, but it was in St. Louis, Missouri. The sermons were long, especially for a six year old, but it was nothing to have been there three hours. We were on our way to the feast. My parents had never been to the Sabbath service. We were on our way to the feast in Big Sandy. Two years earlier in 1956, the booklet 1975 and Prophecy had been written. And based upon that booklet and the teaching of many ministers at that time, the world was going to end sometime around 1975. Now, I was six years old. 1975 would have made me 23 years old when Christ would return. What did I have to look forward to? I wouldn't even, I'd barely get out of high school, much less go to college. If you go to college, what's the, what's the, what's the use? I wasn't going to have a life. If you came into church any time after 1980, D-Day had passed, and nobody thought about it anymore, and we just went right on like the world's going to be here forever. But for those of us who are young people in 1975, well, I mean, I'm going up to 1975, 76, it meant a lot. I can recall sitting on the edge of my bed, my mother's in the doorway, and I'm in tears explaining to her that she got to grow up and go to college, get married, have a family, and live her life. And I would never, ever be able to do those things. When we, got, those of us at that time, we got old enough to think about baptism. None of us wanted to get baptized. It wasn't because we didn't believe. It was because we didn't want to be with spirit beings when Christ returned. So we'd do anything to stop that. We wanted to live through and be human beings in the millennium. So we didn't think about baptism. I can still recall sitting in the living room at a house where my brother and I lived years ago. We're both single. We're talking to Mr. Kakis. And I said, Mr. Kakis, you know, all the kids I grew up with, they lived under the threat of the atomic bomb and being attacked by Russia. All of us kids in the church lived under the threat of the return of Christ. He just looked at me because he couldn't imagine that, you could, that that could be true. So 1975 impacted us kids. It also impacted the adults. You know, my dad never expected to retire. Thankfully, he had the wisdom, God gave him the wisdom, not to make mistakes he could have made that would have left our family in dire circumstances. Dad died when he was 80, lived to retire, had a long retired life, enjoyed it. Lots of stories from those days. But despite my best intentions in the present, in, motivate, <clears throat> in motivating us today, with the state of the world, I'd forgotten what had been done to me 50 years ago. 
I hadn't considered that I was inflicting that same attitude on every young person who was listening to me as it was being inflicted on me when I was a young person. If you're a young person with your whole life in front of you, even a middle-aged person with mountains you still want to climb, it's important for you to go into the future with your eyes wide open preparing yourself for the challenges that you will face. But you don't need us olders killing your joy with the wrong approach to the end of the age. If you're one of those like me who can only fondly remember being young, we as olders need to seriously think about how we relate to the young people in our lives, whether they're our own children, the youth in the church, our grandchildren, or any other young people that look up to us, that come to us for advice and that sort of thing. As olders, we're supposed to be examples. We're supposed to share our wisdom. But we can't do that if we're thought of as being too negative to talk to. So, so today, <clears throat> First, I want to affirm that it is good for young people to have dreams, hopes, and aspirations. And this is not the time to shut down, to cocoon, to disengage from the world. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The world has far too few godly young people engaging it. Our young people need to grow up to be in the fight. Secondly, I want to discuss three primary areas of life that as a young person, you've really got to be prepared to face, or you got to, you really got to have in your life in order to face what you've got coming. And lastly, I've got some sample questions that may be eye-opening for the olders, but the youngers have also got to think about as they move into their future, as they chase their dreams, how am I going to deal with these situations? And there's the kind of things as we go through this, the continuing thought is going to be, how do we as olders help the youngers prepare and deal with these things and achieve in their lives? And hopefully by the end, <clears throat> If there is a divide between the generations, hopefully we can begin to narrow that divide and open up those channels of communication. So what about it? Is it wrong for young people, or for any of us for that, for that matter, to dream about accomplishing things, dream about the things that we want to do, plan and hope, the future. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Let's see what God says. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So here's the first indication that God expected man to work, to accomplish, to do things. We'll look at what Solomon says to add that, add to that here in a few minutes. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. This is a side note. When I was putting this sermon together, I was listening to the oldies station that, on uh, XM radio. And for me, oldies means 60s, 70s, and maybe a little bit of the 80s, but most good music quit when we got to the 80s. But I was struck by how many songs that I heard that were inspired by loneliness. And looking to fill that loneliness 
most of the time in all the wrong places, but it was, they were based upon loneliness. Here God says, I know you're going to be lonely by yourself. I'll provide a help suitable for you. Verse 20. So since it was not good for man to be alone, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of a man. And therefore, says God, because of all I've already told you, for that reason shall a man leave his mother or his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. God designed men and women to want to grow up, and fall in love, and get married, and have kids, and that all those are a good thing. And he said, You shall subdue the earth, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. We were created to interact with the creation, to take control over the earth. Again, another indication that man was designed to work, to accomplish, to do things. Now, just in case, I'm well aware of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7 about marriage and the times that they were living in. And by, the ext by extension, the times that we might think we're living in. And I'm also well aware of what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, regarding the times of persecution. And when we see the abomination that makes desolate. But you know what? We're not there yet. And do we really want to be like the lefties? who believe in man-made climate change, who are refusing to have kids and do things because the world's going to burn up tomorrow. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Just do so with your eyes wide open. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. People look at me strange when I say that this is one of my favorite books in the Bible. But I know that some of the scriptures, like the ones we'll read today, have helped me stay grounded and stay, get through difficult times. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24. Look what it says. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, that he should enjoy food, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor, that he should have a good job and enjoy his work. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. Good food, <clears throat> a good job, the enjoyment that came from those things, God created that. God gave it to man. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10. Solomon repeats the theme. He says, I've seen the travail, that's the work which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He has made everything beautiful in his time, and he has also set eternity in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. But I know there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice, to be happy, and to do good in his life. How much good do we do in our lives if we're disinterested bystanders, if we are so worried about what's about to happen, that we don't do anything, we don't engage with the world? Verse 13, 
and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It is the gift of God. <clears throat> Just like in chapter 2, verse 24, it's a gift from God. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. Go your way, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God now accepts your works. Let your garments be always white, and let your head lack no ointment. In other words, white garments, live righteously and walk with God. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love <clears throat> all the days of the life you're going to be. Those which he has given you under the sun, all the days of your vanity, for that is your portion in this life, and in your labor which you have taken under the sun. For whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. For there is no work, there is no device, there is no knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are eventually going. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. There are other scriptures in Ecclesiastes that continue to make these same points. But we heard about contentment in the sermonette. Solomon is basically saying, get your joy out of the basics of life, your relationships, your work, good food, the good feeling that comes from accomplishing something good. <clears throat> and those are not wrong things to want to do. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth, and walk in the ways of your heart. Walk in the ways and the things you want to enjoy in, in achieving things and going out and chasing your dreams in the sight of your eyes. There are days, even now, that I wish I could recapture some of that energy and some of that dreaming that I had 30, 40 years ago. Because it's the older you get, the more easy it is to be that, oh, well, I plant that tree. It's not going to produce before I die anyway. So what's the use? It's a special time being young. And now I miss my, <clears throat> but that for all these things, in other words, for all we've been talking about, remember, God will bring you into judgment. Chase your dreams, but do so in a way that's going to be pleasing to God. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart. In our modern day, these words say to me, don't look at the evil world around you, let it defeat you. And to us olders, it says, stop focusing on the negative. And remember, you must always put away evil from your flesh. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. For years after I finally took the time to read and study this book, I complained that these were the only verses ever quoted from Ecclesiastes. What did Mr. Casperson do? He proved my point this morning in his sermonette. And he knows, he knows I'm teasing him. <laughs> but when we, when we read this at the end of reading everything else that Solomon says, then these verses really come to life. They really mean something. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. How should we live our lives, young, old, now, or in the future? No matter what the condition of the world is, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. In the end, it's not about finding a spouse. It's not about having a family. Owning a nice home, having a good and meaningful job. All those things are wonderful and good. 
but it's about are we living the way that God wants us to live? You know, God can use all of those things to help develop us into the spiritual adults he wants us to be. And they're not wrong to aspire to. But how are we walking out our lives? Again, as mentioned earlier, these things can become idols if we put them ahead of our relationship with God. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Luke chapter 19. One of the few places, <clears throat> one of the few places I could think of where Jesus gives direct instructions as to how we should approach, approach our life even in these last days. Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, those listening to Jesus teach, he had a, and spoke a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And listen to this. And because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. To how many of us does that line apply? I'm not saying it won't. I'm not saying it, it's not real close, but verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. We all know that nobleman is Jesus Christ. And he called his 10 servants and delivered to them each one 10 minas. Now today's money, that's worth $8,000 a piece. He handed each person $80,000. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. What an interesting phrase, Occupy till I come. In the English Standard Version, it says, <clears throat> Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten, ten minas each. And he said to them, Engage in business until I come. Other translations say, Trade with these until I come. Do business with these until I come. In other words, I expect you to be living out your life, investing this money I've given you, doing something with it until the day I get back, till the day I show up. I don't expect you to quit a month before I get here. I want to come back and find you so doing. Verse 15, it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called to him, the ones to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Verse 20. And another, <clears throat> the last one, came, saying, Lord, behold, here is your pound or your mina, which I have kept laid up in this napkin. For I feared you. I feared that you were about to return, and I wouldn't be able to accomplish anything anyway. And look how evil the world is. You can't really expect me to do anything with all this evil around me, can you? No, no, it doesn't. I know it doesn't say that exactly, but it certainly fits if we're thinking that way. The servant says, because you are an, because you are an austere man, you take up that you did not lay down, you reap that you, that you didn't sow. <clears throat> he said unto him, Jesus, that is, out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then didn't you give me my money, or give my money to the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury. We all know the rest of the story. But the important part to me is, occupy until I come. Now again, he didn't say to go on as though everything is still the same and nothing is different and nothing is changing. But he is saying, you don't quit. Just because the situation around you gets a bit uncomfortable, you don't stop. 
you occupy till I come. As olders, we cannot be giving the impression to the youngers that it's okay to go and hibernate, or that it's better to do that. No, we have to be encouraging them to occupy till he comes. So now with all that said, there are two questions that I believe every young person must answer and every older must be able to help them answer. The first is, how will you live a godly life? How will you have a godly marriage? How will you raise godly children? Enjoy a career in which you can bring honor and glory to God, all while living in an increasingly more satanic world. How are you going to do that? Not that it can't be done, but how are you going to do that? In conjunction with that first question, there's a second that goes with it, I think. <clears throat> what is your responsibility as a young person to impact the world around you as a Christian? Or are you simply to live out your life, again, as a disinterested bystander, as isolated as you possibly can be in the world around you? It's not that a person can't live a godly life in an evil world. And asking that question is not meant to discourage anybody. Christians have been doing that for 2,000 years. You know, those of us who have been blessed to grow up, I used to look at my dad and think that he may have had the perfect years to grow up because he was just old enough. He didn't have to fight World War II. And he was too old to fight in Korea. And he had a, a good life with a good career and earned a reasonable amount of money and so on and so forth. I suppose our lives overlap. But anybody our age, my age, we grew up in a, in a country that the rest of the world, past or present, cannot begin to imagine. It was a somewhat Christian country all of our lives. We were blessed to live mainly in peace. We have been blessed to live with prosperity and freedom that no one in history, perhaps outside of Israel during the judges, has ever known. Reaching our goals and our dreams and our hopes and the years that I grew up and lived was simply a matter of how hard did I want to chase? How hard did I want to work? I mean, yeah, luck entered into a little bit, or we might say blessings from God, but still, that world doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. Now, some things still are here, but not that peaceful world. I mean, I lived for years without a lock locked on my house. You think I'd do that today? So how will we navigate the world, young people, that you're growing into? And how will you reach your goals without becoming spotted by the world? I think there are three essentials you've got to have if you're going to do that. First and foremost, you must develop, build, and nurture a relationship with God. Before there's a girlfriend or a boyfriend, before there's a husband or a wife or a family, <clears throat> before you go to college, before you get a job, before anything else in your life, there must be a developing, close, and intimate relationship with God. Nothing else I will have already said or will say in this sermon is of any value if you don't have that to start with. And there's nothing that we as olders can do that will help the youngers more than to encourage them in their pursuit of God. Many of us have spent decades now with God. We have stories that we can tell. 
the good and the bad and the ugly. We can't be shy about sharing all of it because anybody who's walked this walk of life for 30, 40, 50 years knows there's some of all of that in it. God never promised us a rose garden. So sharing those things with the youngers is part of what we need to be doing. John 16, 33. These scriptures only make sense to a person who's connected to God. Notice how the relationship is emphasized here. John 16, 33. Jesus Christ says, Have this, I said these things to you that in me you might have peace. The only place we will have peace is in him. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Please, 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 don't read that word tribulation and simply think of persecution for your religious beliefs. This life can be full of joy. As a young person, chase that joy but it can also be full of trials and tribulations. Jesse and Nicole have known each other since childhood. They both grew up in this faith, and they shared the dreams that all young people dream. And when they came of age, their friendship grew <clears throat> to be a marriage and a family. Jesse and Nicole have been married for several years now. They love each other very much. And they just had their fourth child. It all sounds wonderful. But you should know that their first child, who was born healthy, had an accident. And today is six or seven year old. It's impossible to communicate. He doesn't speak. You don't really know if he understands anything you say to him. Her second child, a daughter, was born with cerebral palsy. She lives her life in a wheelchair. Finally, their third child was born healthy and normal, a little girl. Recently, Nicole has been pregnant again. And for, for many months of her pregnancy, the worry was that the child would not go to term and that she would lose the child. And thanks to many prayers <clears throat> and a lot of faith, Nicole did give birth to a second healthy little girl. In the world, <clears throat> young people, you will have tribulation, but take heart, Jesus says. I've overcome the world. Matthew 6, 33. I hope I don't seem like I'm jumping around too much, but just to refocus so we don't lose sight of the main point before anything else, you must first and foremost develop build and nurture a relationship with God. Where would Jesse and Nicole be without that? Matthew 6, 33. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, verses 19 through 32, will be added to you. I'm sure there are many olders in this room who can say the same thing. And again, we need to tell these stories and share these stories and encourage with these stories. But I can say without reservation that that statement is true. I still marvel the way God has granted me some of my most basic youthful longings. And Mr. Casperson mentioned those wants. I can go down a list of a half a dozen that God has given me in my life. 
that and they don't come without troubles, without trials, without tribulations. But God has been more than faithful in my life. And he will do so, young people, for you as well. Psalm 127, verse 1. I'm going to wrap up this first point with these two psalms. The first from Solomon, the second one we assume from David, but we don't know for sure. Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, let those words sink in. Those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. If you do all these things without God, it will create nothing but anxious toil. But if you walk with God, if you work in harmony with God, because it says unless, unless, if you do it with God, You'll be blessed by him, and he will give to his beloved peaceful, restful sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Psalm 128, verse 1. Again, notice it starts, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Sounds like Solomon talking. You shall eat the fruit of your labor of your hands. You'll be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine. One within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed and woman. Be blessed, who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace upon Israel. Is that not the life that we all have dreamt of at one time or another? So, one more time, before we go to point two, before anything else, you must first and foremost develop and build and nurture a relationship with God. Point two, set and clarify your standards, your belief, your values firmly in your heart and mind so that you are standing on a rock rather than sand when the storms come along and they will come. The old saying is still true. You must stand for something or you'll fall for anything. I paraphrased a little bit and I said, if you don't know what you stand for and you aren't willing to stand for it, you will be easily deceived and will fall for anything. If you've been alive and aware for the last few years in our country, you know how true these statements are. You know, our standards, our beliefs, our values, they cover all aspects of our life. <clears throat> First and foremost, of course, you must have a firm foundation of spiritual values. When the old church fell apart back in the 90s, despite the fact that I had grown up since six years old in the church, we got to that point, <clears throat> and it dawned on me and came clear to my mind that my beliefs weren't my own. I'd grown up this way. My beliefs were what mom and dad did. And yeah, I mean, I had no problems with what I believed. I wasn't rebellious against them. But I thought to myself, if I'm going to stand for these things, if I'm going to put my life in the line for these things, I better know why I believe them. And so there's an old, old commercial, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, taste them again for the first time. And that's what I did. I sat down with my computer and my concordance and my Bible, and I figured out what do I believe and why do I believe it? Young people, 
It's got to be yours. You've got to know why you believe what you believe. <clears throat> and don't be like us when you come of age to be baptized. Counsel and be baptized. Don't put it off. If you want God to commit to you, shouldn't he expect a commitment from you first? Again, don't be like we were when I was your age. Trust God that Romans 8, 28 is true. And don't delay taking that step forward in baptism. But your standards and your beliefs and your values go beyond doctrinal and spiritual beliefs. That's your foundation. But what do you believe about the role of government in your life? How much can government tell you about how you have to live your life. Matthew 22, verse 21, I'll just read it. Then says he, this is Jesus, says he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. Here's the operative question, young and old alike. Which parts of your life belong to God, are governed by God? And which parts of your life does God allow the government to have a say-so over? It is more increasingly more important that you know the answer to that question. About climate change, is it man-made? Is it real? How should you let it impact your life? Because there are those who belong to this religion of climate change that plan for it to impact your life dramatically long after I'm dead. How do you feel about the medical profession? What do you believe about vaccinations? What role does social media play in your life? How do you feel about governmental control of social media? Are you aware of AI? Do you know what AI is? Are you aware of the fact that you're already being impacted by AI and social media? What do you believe about credit? The use of digital money, debit cards, credit cards. And there are many, many, many other things which you need to be prepared to decide, what do I think about this? You know, as was mentioned earlier, Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But it's not the end of knowledge. We take the belief we have in God, we take his values, his teachings, his principles, and we use those to guide up the rest of our lives and make decisions about the rest of our lives. Point number three. Point three is actually the second question we started with. What, if any, responsibility do we have or do you have as a young person, as a Christian, to impact the world around you? Or are you simply to live out your life as much as possible in isolation from the rest of the world? John 17, verse 9. Here's Jesus in a prayer to the Father, praying for his disciples and for all of us. And listen to what he says. John 17, verse 9. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you, Father, but Holy Father, keep them in your name, those which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. <clears throat> Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I don't ask you to take them out of the world. 
but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. So sanctify them in your truth, or in truth. Your word is the truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So we read all of this, and it says we are in the world, but we're not of the world, but we've been sent into the world. We've not been taken out of the world, yet we're not to be a part of the world. I'm 72 years old. I've been walking this way for 65 years. And I'm still struggling with exactly how am I to walk out those words. As young people, I feel like it's very, very important that you think about these things and ask yourself, how do I walk out these words? How am I in the world? I'm then sent into the world, I'm not to be of the world. Because these verses speak to our question, how are our lives supposed to impact the world around us if we are supposed to at all? You won't be able to impact the lives of the world around you if you're closed off from the world. More and more every day, we are living in a divided world where it's becoming more and more difficult for each side to live alongside of the other side. And whether we want to believe it or not, we are not a third side. We are on one side or the other. And do we all understand that there's a large portion of this society that hates us? They've never met us. They don't know us. But if they did, they would hate us. So you have to ask the question, answer the question. Have you been called to have an impact on the world around you? Or are you simply to get through it as best you can? Without that, Matthew 5, Mark 9, Luke 14, those are all in italics on your sheets because we're not going to turn there. They're, they're well known. You are to be the salt of the earth. As a young person, think about what that means. Think about the instructions and in seeking God for direction in your life. How do you live out being salt? Again, in Matthew 5, Luke 8, and Luke 11, you are to be a light in a very dark world. How does God expect you to live out the role of his light in the world? So how are we to in interact with the world around us? Whether we're older or younger, but the younger people got longer to go. So, with all we've discussed today, how will we apply, how will you as young people apply and consider these real life situations? Where will you decide to live when you're out on your own? Because there's a big difference between California, Washington State, and New York, and states like Florida, Missouri, and Iowa. And if you're of that age, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you definitely would need to find out. Will you homeschool your children? Or will they go to public school or private school? What are you ready for them to be exposed to in school? I taught for years. I think about a young person today going into education. The school where you are teaching as an elementary teacher has decided to celebrate Gay Pride Month all month long. You're expected to decorate your room to celebrate Gay Pride, to teach the enrichments you've been given for your curriculum that, <clears throat> that highlight the gay and trans lifestyle. At work this week, you've been told different scenario, that there will be a mandatory training on critical race theory 
And you were asked to come prepared to talk about <clears throat> the impact that your white privilege has had on your life and how you've been able to achieve because of it. And what is your plan to confront your whiteness going forward? These are all taken out of situations I'm aware of or on the news. These are all real life situations. In your first day on the job, you're, in, you're introduced to your new boss. <clears throat> a man who dresses like a woman, acts like a woman, and is totally convinced that he is a woman. He's your new boss. You got a job as a social studies teacher at Bennell School. And as part of the curriculum, you're expected to teach critical race theory in the 1619 Project. <clears throat> your elementary child comes home from school today and asks what it means to declare your pronouns. And oh, by the way, what are pronouns anyway? It's move-in day at college. You're moving into your dorm room. Your new roommate introduces himself and informs you that her pronouns are he, him, they, them. There's a new virus sweeping the nation and being proactive, your company has decided that to remain employed, everyone in the company must receive the new vaccine developed just for this disease. Or the university where you plan to attend in the fall has made the same requirement of all students. To be enrolled in elementary school, you're told that your child must have received all of the childhood vaccinations they're supposed to have, do you realize that that is now up to 70 vaccinations? Many of them all combined into one, but for 70 different ones. The gay professor of the required sociology class you have to have your freshman year uses the class to really push the gay trans agenda. And if you don't answer the questions the way he wants them answered on your test and essays, you may not pass the class. You graduated college with your business administration degree. You've been offered a lucrative job at Target. But Target has totally bought into the gay trans agenda and is actually pushing that agenda. Do you take the job? Why or why not? Now, I've recently heard a person argue that, well, that's no greater sin than the fact that they're open every Sabbath. So, therefore, if they're open on Saturday or pushing gay and trans, it's six of one, half dozen of another. Is that valid thinking or isn't it? <clears throat> and then as you think about all of these situations, think about them in context of Romans chapter 1 verse 32, and ask yourself, how does it apply or doesn't it apply? <clears throat> you see, young people in today's world face a society that we olders could never have dreamed would exist. Growing up for me, school was reading, writing, and arithmetic. Even the college classes I took, and I've got two bachelor's degrees, a master's degree, and I'm a thesis short of a doctorate. And I never dealt with college classes the way things are today. For the most part, we stayed on task, stayed on topic, and went right through. The biggest job problem I ever had was the Sabbath, maybe the holy days, and teaching school, Christmas was a bit of an inconvenience. That's it. That's not the world our young folks live in today. Young people, chase your dreams, but be prepared for the world you're chasing in. And we olders need a more complete answer than the world's a mess, sure hope Christ returns soon. Yeah, I do too. But that doesn't help dealing with today. You've got to find a way to acknowledge 
the reality of the world as it is, while positively trying to help our young people navigate their future through. Maybe this can be a start. Our young people can't just give up on their futures just to wait for the end. But you know what, really? Even putting this together has changed my own personal attitude at my ripe old age. None of us can afford to just hunker down in a cave and wait for Christ to return. And we need each other, the youth and the hoary heads. Let's see if we can't narrow that gap and learn to be helpers of one another's joy.